Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Christine Armstrong about her incredible around the world cycle trip. Hi, Christine. Hello, Sarah. Good to talk to you. Oh, it's great to talk to you too. Where where are we speaking to you? Where are you at the moment? At the moment, we are home in Surrey. Home in Surrey. Oh, lovely. Now, Christine, can you just tell everybody just a little bit more about you? I just returned from spending best part of two years cycling around the world, but I am not a great athlete. I am almost 60. I cycle very slowly. I don't like cycling up hills and I still get off and push my way up them. And quite honestly, if I could do it, then absolutely anybody can. Oh, do you know, I absolutely, I love this. I love it so much because, um, you know, guess, guessing your email with just the details of what you did. I think the first line basically says, I am the world's slowest cyclist. I'm going to be 60 later on this year. Um, you know, everyone overtakes me, even old ladies on bikes doing their shopping. You know, I do not like hills and just get off and push. But let's just, let's just go back a little bit. So where, when did you first start cycling? Well, I cycled as a child a bit and then when I went to university I cycled around town on my bicycle and after I'd finished university a friend and I decided we'd like to go on holiday together but money was a big concern because there wasn't very much of it and in the end we came up with the really cheap idea of cycling from her house in Dorset to my house just outside Southampton and my bike was completely decrepit and wasn't up to the job, but a friend of mine very kindly lent me her reasonable one. And we spent five days cycling from Dorset to Southampton. And we had such a fantastic time that we then scraped the money together, took the ferry over to France from Portsmouth to Saint Malo, and spent a week cycling from Saint Malo to Roscoff and caught the ferry back. And we it was just fantastic. And then Following that, I met my husband and discovered that the previous summer he'd done a cycling holiday with a friend from uni. And it just sort of seemed that it would be a good idea to do cycling holidays together. And so we just started doing, you know, the first time we went away on a cycling holiday. And then it was it was just after that, well, where are we going cycling this year? So we used to go away for our cycling for our holiday cycling everywhere, usually in Northern Europe, north of the Alps somewhere. And um, we just carried on doing that. And then the children came along. And when they were young, we used to go abroad and take our bikes with us and go out for day bike rides, again, in Northern Europe. And we didn't cycle in the UK because I was too frightened of the traffic and... Why would you when you can go to Holland or Germany and cycle on beautiful cycle lanes with great infrastructure where the kids can cycle freely? And then when the youngest was eight, we decided it was time that we could go off and just take our bikes with us and not need a car or anything else. Um, I think nowadays if we would just have gone with the children from when they were very young because when our kids were young, they didn't have the trailer bikes and the trailers and all the wonderful stuff they've got now to take kids with with you. It just didn't exist. So you're going on these incredible family cycling holidays. Which is a, ho- which is a cycle holiday that stands out for you? Well, I... It's hard to say which stands out. The very first one we did was along the Danube cycle path because we knew that that was the busiest in Europe and it had great infrastructure and we went to Germany quite regularly. So we took the train down to Passau in the southeast corner of Germany and then cycled from the German border along to Vienna, had a couple of days in Vienna, then took the train back to Salzburg and cycled from there back to where we'd started and and then took the train home again and just had a great time. And that was so good. The following year, we took the ferry over to Denmark 
because that was in the days when the ferries still ran to Denmark. And we cycled from Esbjerg along up along the coast of Denmark and then took the kids to Legoland for a couple of days on the way home and then back. And, yeah, we, we just carried on. We went to Belgium. We'd been to Holland, Germany. Um, exciting ones were when our eldest was 16, my husband had always wanted to go to Canada, so we decided to go to Canada on holiday. But once he started looking at what sort of trip we would do, instead of just doing the, the normal sort of driving trip, we booked ourselves a cycling trip, which was an organised one. So they carried the stuff for you. and We didn't take our own bikes, but we spent a week cycling through the Rockies, which was just fantastic. Most of the cycle routes, you went along the valley and you had all the mountains up around you and very little traffic. We just had a fabulous time. So, Christy, let's talk a little bit about the big goal of cycling the world. How did this idea start? Where did it start to germinate from? I don't know when it actually started, but over the years doing our cycling trips, we just kept saying to each other, when we retire, we're going to go and do a big cycling trip. And it may have been 10 years ago or more, I don't remember, but I just know that it was something we talked about and we had in our minds that one day we would go on a big cycling trip. And the catalyst for it was our youngest left university so all the children had left university and were independent and it was a couple of it was sort of later that year we were just sitting down one evening and chatting and we sort of talked it over and said well we don't need to be here for the children they're all independent now if we wait until we're retirement age which for us would be 67 there's quite a reasonable possibility that we won't be fit enough to go cycling around the world or even if we're fit enough to cycle, we may not want to spend our time um, in a tent, living in a tent. And why don't we just go now? Which was quite a radical decision for two very normally pretty cautious accountants to say, right, we'll throw in our jobs and we'll just go and we'll just see what happens. But we, it seemed a bit, at the time quite an easy decision for us to make together and we did and that was in November we gave ourselves plenty of time to prepare because um, I had was on a long period of notice at work so we decided that we would leave the sort of 16 17 months later leave in April because we wanted to set out from home and we thought April would be a good time because the weather was improving we'd be happy to camp we didn't want to sort of set out in the winter and that that was it. That decision was made. The decision wasn't that difficult, but I think the main thing to do is when you've done it, once you tell people, you then do it. So let's just quickly go back. So the definition of a big cycling trip, because I know everyone has like different definitions. You've obviously done a lot of cycling. Why did you decide on the whole world? Why did you know you could you could have done a cycle trip anywhere, and yet you decided to really push the bucket out? Well, we 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 travelled a lot in Europe. Um, as I say, mainly cycling holidays in Europe. We've done. We had lived uh, abroad before. When we first got married, we lived in Papua New Guinea for six months. I've really got wanderlust. I love travelling, um, and we we didn't have any specific goal. We we just thought we'll go cycling for maybe. My husband kept saying one year and I kept saying two. So we thought we'll, we'll go somewhere between one and two years. So we'll just set off and see how far we get. And if we don't enjoy it, we'll stop. So when you when you were sort of sat down discussing this together, what, I mean, accountants, I have a lot of accountants in my family, like my dad's an accountant, my sister's an accountant. Um, what, what thoughts are going through your head? Because I'd imagine both of you are almost very logical in how you think about things. You're absolutely right. So we, we're in the fortunate position of being in the stage of life where we've got a house. So we thought we can rent the house out and that will fund the trip. We'll be living quite cheaply because we'll be in a tent. So that would work out. And we also 
decided that we'd set out from home and we would make our way eastwards. So that would mean we'd go from here, we'd cycle across France. We decided to follow the Eurovelo CIS, which is a European cycle route which goes from the Atlantic to the Black Sea, which follows rivers all the way across France, then a bit of the Rhine, and then goes from the Danube all the way to the Black Sea. And we thought, I I studied languages at university and speak French and German. So we thought if we go across France and Germany and Austria, it's countries we know, languages I speak, that would be really easy to get into it for us. And then as we got, as we were more used to it, we would then sort of gradually get to the more well, difficult might be the wrong word, but not countries we weren't so used to and languages we didn't speak as we made our way through Eastern Europe. And then we had intended to then go to Central Asia, to the stands in Central Asia. And we read up a lot about that, cycling on Silk Road and things, and felt reasonably confident because I could, I speak some Russian and can get by. And we just thought we'll see how far we get. So you've made this incredible decision together. You're being logical. You can rent your house out. You know you're going to be camping. You can keep the costs down. Um, I'd just be interested, who were the first... Who did you tell first? The children. What was their reaction? <laughs> that completely matter of fact. We thought they'd be excited or something, and they just sort of said, "Oh yeah, we knew you'd do that one day." <laughs> so, so you got your children. So they weren't they weren't worried about you at all. And how old were you at this point? So, oh, I would you be fifty six? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So yeah. So you've told the children, the children yeah. are, you know, whatever, mum, dad, go, <laughs> go cycle yeah. around the world, awesome. What about your friends? What was their reaction? That was different. They were, it was much more of, wow, aren't you frightened? How are you going to manage? Um, aren't, yeah, those were the general things and just surprised and, oh, aren't you brave? And, and that, but the biggest thing that shocked me was a lot of people said to me, people who were sort of older, been married for a long time, said, how are you going to manage being with your husband every day? Which absolutely baffled me because that wasn't anything that we thought was a problem. We just thought we'll really enjoy having all this time together where we have, you know, we're not consumed by careers. We both worked really hard. My husband especially worked long hours. We just thought it'd be really nice to spend a lot of time together. But I was just stunned how many people raised that as a potential problem. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. It almost tells you a lot about a lot about their relationship. So tell yeah. tell us tell everybody a little bit more about your your husband, your partner on the trip. I mean, how long have you been married, or how long have you been together for? Well, we got married in 1984, so we have now been married for 33 years. Um, we knew each other for three years before we got married, and we met together on our first day at work. We started off as training accountants together. So, and uh, he's generally pretty relaxed he's absolutely adores cycling he would cycle all day every day and my only problem with him on the trip was restraining him and getting him not to want to cycle all day every day and giving me some time off the bike um but he's he's fantastic he's tremendously supportive and we're very much an equal partnership I would describe myself as very much a feminist and he's very supportive of equality in, in everything that we do, which yeah. helps. So you've spoken to your family, you've spoken to your friends that you've told them about your trip and, you know, you're having, you know, these conversations back and forth, you know, what about spending all this time with your husband? And generally what it is, it's those are other people's fears that they, that they you know, end up giving back to you. But what about for you? I mean, did you have any fears or worries or concerns uh, no, <laughs> we we tend to think, well, if there's a problem, we'll sort it out. Everywhere in the world's really connected now. So if there's a problem, you can just fly home. And we were very much, we didn't want to be very rigid in our plans. So 
our watchword was to be flexible. So if we weren't enjoying something, we wouldn't do it. If we decided we'd like a few days off the bike, we'd take them. If we wanted to take the train for a while, we would. We wouldn't rigidly stick to having to cycle everywhere. And we just thought, well, that, we'll be fine with that. And that's how it turned out. So what was your what was your, did you have quite a detailed plan for when you set off? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you both love spreadsheets and if it was, you know, we are going to do 20 miles every single day. And if you planned out the first hundred days or, I mean, I know you've got this word flexible, but was there like, obviously like more of a structure? Well, being accountants, we do, do both love spreadsheets. Yes. So we have spreadsheets and we plan the route sort of and spent I mean, I'd spent ages sort of scouring maps and looking at where we would stay. And because our initial idea was to go to the Black Sea and we got ourselves maps and we got um, German cycling guidebooks that mapped the cycle route all the way to the Black Sea, we were going to follow that. And I did sort of set a plan of how we thought in the beginning, how far we'd get every day and where we'd stay. But that wasn't rigidly set. So... We knew where we were going, but if we wanted to stop for a couple of days, we would. And also, when we were initially planning it, in our heads, we thought we'll do, we'll manage 50 miles a day easily because the terrain's going to be fairly straightforward. And we knew that would be a fairly reasonable amount for us to cycle. But we hadn't worked out how much heavier our luggage was going to be than normal because of the camping gear and also how long it would take every morning to take sort of pack away everything and set up in the evening and so I think my husband got this 50 miles a day in his head and it ended up that we're doing 50 miles a day but it meant we did nothing else but get up get ready cycle all day sort of put camp up eat sleep and I had a bit of a wobbly after a while and said this isn't what I signed up for I want to do more less miles go slower and we don't have to do 50 miles a day so that was what the arrangement we came to but um and I wanted some more rest days so we'd have rest days and we had rest days all the way through the trip but my husband's idea of having a rest day is usually to go off on a bike ride on his own (laughs) So take us back to the start, whether it was the night before or the morning of, whether, you know, how you were feeling leaving from, from your house, you know, what was what was that like? It was uh, it was exciting, but it was also a bit unnerving because it's a big step into the unknown. So a few friends came to wave us off as we cycled away from our house. And our first day was to cycle down to New Haven to catch the ferry to France. And that was actually one of the hardest days because I hadn't sat on a bike for six months before we went. I I don't like cycling when it's cold in the winter, so I hadn't gone and done any training. And I figured that I'd get fit as we cycled, which is actually how it worked. But it did mean the first day, which is 53 miles from where we lived down to New Haven, was pretty hard going. And I was absolutely shattered by the time we got to New Haven. So what? Um, Sorry, carry on. But it, yeah, we managed it. I, I knew that I could do that much in a day. And after that, it was easier. So when did you start? Was there a point during the trip when you got into your routine or you got into your flow and you were like, yeah, this is this is it? Probably on day two. <laughs> <laughs> we were amazed how how quickly we adapted. It was just it was just very easy. Um, there was nothing to think about there was no pressure all you had to think about is where we're going to get our food and where are we going to sleep tonight and it it was just a way of life that we really took to straight away and loved was there were there moments during the trip I'm sure there's been lots of challenging times or or situations can you think of a challenging time that, that you went through well the most difficult time was we cycled we're cycling across Europe and we got as far as Serbia and we were just outside Belgrade and the cycle route into Belgrade actually follows the main road into Belgrade which is single carriageway road full of lorries and cars and and really felt like a death trap so we took a, a small 
lane marked on our map spruce woods which was going beautifully and then it started to rain and the path just turned into gloopy sticky mud and the mud stuck between my front wheel and my mud guard and the bike came to a halt at about three miles an hour and I fell sideways off it landed on my top of my arm and injured my arm um we managed to get into Belgrade with the help of some very nice Serbian people who helped get us on the train and sort us out and took us to the station. After a couple of days, my arm wasn't improving. We looked on the internet and discovered that Serbia, the reputation of the Serbian, Serbian Health Service wasn't great. So we thought, right, we'll just fly back to the UK, get my arm sorted out, and then we'll come back and carry on. So we flew back to the UK, went along to the hospital and discovered I'd broken my arm. So that changed all the plans. What what happened next? Well, as it turned out, we hadn't let our house. The house somehow had managed not to be let, which we couldn't understand. But it just seemed tailor-made then. So we moved back into our house, although our furniture was all in storage. So we just camped in our house. And I had to sort of get the arm better, then had to do physiotherapy. And it was actually a long time before I felt able to manage a fully laden touring bike. So it was actually five months before we set off again. So by then we're up to November. Wow, that's a that's a that's sort of quite a long break, really. Was it difficult sort of adjusting, you know, being on the road for so long, then, you know, breaking breaking your arm, having, you know, going back home and doing the rehab? It, it was just annoying, really, because we wanted to get back and carry on the trip. And, and all of a sudden we couldn't. And I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at the same time. So that was a bit of a shock to my system to sort of cope with that. But really, it was just a question of doing the rehab. And we just then when we realised, when we thought we'd be ready to set off again, we tried to let the house again. And this time the house sort of went almost instantly. So as soon as tents were going to move in, we we set that as our date and, and set off again. But of course, it was no good then to fly back to Belgrade because you wouldn't want to go cycling in East, across Eastern Europe and then through Central Asia in the middle of winter. So we had to think, what are we going to do next? And it was really weird because I, I sort of woke up in the middle of the, the night one night and was thinking, oh, and I had a bright idea of where to go next, which was somewhere we'd not really talked about at all. And the next morning I woke up and said to my husband, I've had this really wacky idea of where we go next. But he just looked at me and said, New Zealand. It's uh-huh. just like telepathy. Is it? Yeah, how did you know? So we decided to fly to New Zealand and try and maybe do the trip the other way. And instead of going from home eastwards with the idea of maybe we'd end up getting as far as Australia or New Zealand, we'd start out on the other side of the world and head back towards the UK. So that's what we did. So why did you pick New Zealand? Why did it pop into your head? I think it might have done because our daughter was was living there at the time but also I don't know really it just did it just seemed to fit so so tell us so tell us about cycling over in New Zealand did you go to the North Isle the South Isle where did you cycle we went to the North Island and we cycled sort of right up to the far north and then back down to Auckland and then also some friends of ours were over in New Zealand over Christmas and invited us to go and stay with them and our daughter as well so we had a fantastic Christmas with people we knew and then we cycled all the way down through the North Island down to the South Island and we had um, three months in New Zealand all together and it's a lovely place but I'm not sure that I go back cycling there again. Why, why is that? Well we found the roads and the drivers not very conducive to cycling it it was more terrifying than cycling in the UK. The driver, I mean, they're lovely people, fantastic people, too. You put them behind the wheel of a car and then they're a complete nightmare. The roads are narrow. There's lots of logging lorries. You off, you off sometimes have to end up on the main roads because there's so few roads in New Zealand. And the drivers, they're just going. And if you're in the way, well, that's tough. 
So, 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 so what would be like a typical day for you guys? Were you, were you camping out? Were you staying in B&Bs, youth hostels? How, how was Camp. it? Camp. It was almost always camping in New, in New Zealand and then Australia because they've got great campsites and we generally stayed in campsites. So we'd wake up, have breakfast, get the tent sort of taken down, everything packed away. And it's, it used to take us, can't work out how it used to take us so long. So we'd probably set off half nine, something like that, get some food, stop somewhere for a picnic for lunch, and then probably four, five or six, depending on where we were going, where campsites were, we we make up the, the, the tent for the night, get ready and have some food and then carry on. What would be the highlights of your day? We just love cycling along. As I said, I, I'm not a fast cyclist and my bike has flat handlebars and I, I ride it like a Dutch person rides their bike, very much sit up. I like to sit up and just look at everything going past. So highlights of my day, just sort of cycling slowly along, looking at everything around. Oh, that sounds epic! What, what was? Um, did you visit anything in particular? You were going. Were you going to see certain sites, or or were you just sort of just going with the flow? Just going with the flow. Literally going with the flow. Um, so the top sites in New Zealand were probably seeing the giant kauri trees. Um, yeah, that was probably the best site. Oh, and going to Rotorua and seeing the bubbling hot springs and things like that. Did you make it to the Franz Josef Glacier? Last year? No, we didn't. We only got halfway down. We got as far as Greymouth. And then I'm also a bit of a train person. I love travelling by train. So one of the sort of great train journeys of the world is supposed to be across from Greymouth across to Christchurch. So we did that as well. Um, and was it was it a great train journey? It was a great train journey, yeah. Oh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> So what, what did you decide next then? So, you know, there's been sort of lots of lots of up and downs. You've done sort of Europe, you've broken your hand, come back to the UK, you've cycled in New Zealand. Where did you go next? So next we went to Australia, mainly because you're thinking, well, if we've come all this way to New Zealand, it'd be stupid not to go to Australia. And my husband had been on business before and had liked it. But I, at that time, had absolutely no desire to go to Australia. It wasn't one of the places on my bucket list at all, but... If you're in New Zealand, it'd be silly not to go to Australia. So we decided to fly to Australia and we cycled from Sydney to Melbourne and it was absolutely fabulous. We had the most wonderful time and I absolutely adored Australia. And if someone was to say to me, you can go back to either New Zealand or Australia, I would take Australia every time, which really surprises me. But it's fantastic. Were you managing to meet like quite a lot of people along the way? Were there lots of other cyclists out there or? Very few site, touring cyclists, really few. Um, in fact, a bit later in the story, we flew back to Berlin from Japan and we laughed because on our first day cycling from Berlin northwards to the Baltic coast, we reckoned we probably saw three times as many cyclists in that one day as we'd seen in the whole of our time in three months in New Zealand, six weeks cycling in Australia, and then eight weeks cycling in Japan. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So just so, so just give us a quick um, a quick rundown then. So you've done New Zealand, you're now in Australia, you've cycled from Sydney to Melbourne. Did, did you did you what happened next? Well, when I we'd been in Auckland, I'd seen a cruise ship in the harbour and I got this mad idea that maybe once we got to Australia, that we might be able to get all the way back to the UK without flying. And I found this cruise, repositioning cruise from Australia up to Singapore at a ridiculous price. Um, so we booked ourselves on a cruise ship from Australia to Singapore to get ourselves up to Southeast Asia with the idea of cycling up through Southeast Asia. Um, and we had always said we're not the sort of people that do cruises and even so a year or two before we went, we'd been in Southampton and we'd seen one of these giant cruise ships and said, oh, wouldn't it be awful to go on one of those ships? It, we would hate it. It's so not us. And we just had a whale of a time on this two-week 
cruise from Sydney to Singapore and it cost us about the same as flying would have done and our bikes came with us in the cabin so it meant we didn't have to box them up and put them on a plane and worry that they'd all be in one piece at the other end and we had an inside toilet and a bath and a shower which after you spent five months living in tent was really good so we had a great time. A little bit of luxury it can go a long way. (laughs) (laughs) It can, it can. So was the plan then to once you got to Singapore and cycle from Singapore all the way back home? It was. That was the original plan. But that had then changed because my sister had decided to get married, so we wouldn't have time to do that. Um, but we were still sort of going with the flow because we had a few we had about four months before that happened. But we got to Singapore and I'm not very good in the heat. Another thing I'm not good at, you know, I'm really not supposed to be a great traveller because there's so many things I'm not good at. I I couldn't cope with cycling in the heat and humidity of Singapore. And we discovered that after just a couple of days trying. I just said, I can't do it. So we took the train. We cycled into Malaysia just across the border, took the train to Kuala Lumpur and had a week in Kuala Lumpur while we sorted out what we were doing next. So we decided we'd go to Japan because that would be cooler. And our son had been to Japan and said it was a fantastic place. So... And we sort of had in our minds that we would at some point like to go there. So we went and flew to Japan and had eight weeks cycling around Japan. Oh, incredible. So you've been for, you know, this is a long time that you're, that you've been out, that you've been, that you've been traveling. Did you ever get, I don't want to say the word like bored. Did you ever get like cycled out where you're just like, you know what? I just don't want to see a bike again. (laughs) Did you ever have that, those feelings? That only happened once which was much later on at that point no it was still going great didn't didn't every day just happy to get on and carry on and see it my husband did get after about five weeks in Japan he'd had enough because Japan wasn't easy mainly because of the language I mean I tried to learn a bit of Japanese and learn a few letters of things but it was very difficult outside of the main tourist areas nobody speaks any English uh, or very few people speak English and it's just really hard because one for example one day there weren't many campsites and we spent a lot of the time staying in cheap hotels and we booked a cheap hotel and we got to the road it was on. We thought we were on the right road and we walked up and down this road and couldn't see which was the hotel. And I'd learned the Japanese word, the, the characters, for ho- the letters for hotel. I'd also learnt, knew the Chinese sort of pictogram for hotel, but we couldn't work out which was the hotel. And then we had to get the iPad out and look at a picture of it to see which house was actually the hotel. And that was just symptomatic of how things were difficult but sorry carry on but I, apart from that it was just fantastic and I think Japan was just a fabulous place to go and one of the most interesting places to go and I would say to anyone go to Japan it's it was safe it was fascinating we were very ignorant and didn't realize that in Japan everybody cycles so cycling was completely normal and the drivers were really respectful of you so you felt safe on the roads and it's just a fantastic place. So apart from the accident which which happened was there any other countries that you found particularly challenging for cycling? Not really no not not for cycling and then what, which country was your favourite or which country stood out for you and you just thought, you know what, if I'm going to go back to a country, that's where I'm going to go? Well, there were two bits. There was Japan, but then later we came back from Japan, we flew to Berlin and cycled from Berlin to the Baltic coast and then followed the coast of Germany all the way back down to the North Sea coast, down to Dieppe in France and caught the ferry back to New Haven to sort of make a loop. And then our tenants asked if they could extend the lease because it was up at the end of the year. So we said yes. So then we had the winter. So we decided to go over to the states, southern states in the winter. And as part of that, we the visa didn't last long enough to stay there the whole time. So we did a side trip down to Costa Rica and 
we had such a fantastic time in Costa Rica. We hadn't taken our bikes. We'd just taken one pannier each because we thought we were just going for 10 days. But after a few days, I said to my husband, actually, I'd rather stay on here than go back to the States, back to Texas, because we'd cycled from Fort Lauderdale to Houston. And we were not really enjoying that because there were lots of, we being, kept being attacked by dogs in Texas. And we decided to travel through Central America by buses. And we thought, well, we'll start go down to Panama, where her daughter had been the previous year, and enjoy. And then we thought, we'll make our way up through Central America on buses. And if we get to the stage where we're afraid or we don't like it, we can easily fly back to the States. But we had seven weeks there and had a fantastic time. So the two highlights really were Japan and going through Central America, both of which I would recommend to anybody because they were both fantastic. There are other women out there who are thinking, you know, I want to go on a big cycle the world or big cycling tour. What advice would you give to them? The first piece of advice would to get a bicycle that is made, that is exactly the right size for you. Because we had our bikes made a few years ago. And I mean, you can go into a bike shop and spend a fortune on a bike that's off the shelf. And we got us made by a, a bike builder and we thought we're going to be riding these for the rest of our lives and we had them they were designed to fit us and also our style of riding so I've got one that's you know, better designed for sitting upright and husband has got one with drop handlebars but they're because the sizing is absolutely perfect you sit on it all day and and your body's in the right position all the time. So you don't get any twinges or pains or anything because something's not quite right. So that, I think, if you're on a bike trip, is the most important thing. Make sure you get the right size bike. Absolutely. Great advice. Um, and what about sort of, you know, planning for the trip or deciding where to go? What advice would you have around that? I would just say go where you really want to. Don't be put off by tales that people tell you. I mean, to begin with, we were going across Europe, so that's fine. That, that's not difficult. But things like when we were going to the States, people kept saying, oh, oh be really careful. The, the drivers are terrible. Well, we found the drivers in the States absolutely great. Abs you know, there's no problem there at all. You know, if, you, if you can cycle in the UK, you can certainly cycle in the States. Um, yeah, and lots of people will tell you fright stories, and most of them, turned out not to be true like we went through Central America and most people well I beforehand would have thought Central America you know we went through Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala and we had a blast and we're not didn't feel frightened and really enjoyed ourselves I mean we're sensible we don't go out at night we don't get drunk but there are places that most people won't go to and yet we had a fantastic time and the one thing that travelling the world by bike did do was completely restore our faith in human nature. What we discovered was everywhere we went, people were kind, they were hospitable, they were generous. I mean, our first night, well, we went to Japan. And we stayed in a hotel for a couple of nights after we arrived to get ourselves sorted. And then we set out the next day. And it was early afternoon and I was walking up a hill and a car pulled in beside me and it happened to be a couple and the lady spoke English and asked what we were doing. And I told her, and they said, oh, you must come and stay with us. And they sort of took us off to their house for the night. And they had like a little house cottage at the bottom of the garden and they put us, said, you know, you can sleep here. And then they disappeared. And then they came back with bags of food. And that was our evening meal. And then the next morning, they brought a friend of theirs to beat us. And then they gave us a big carrier bag that they said was our emergency rations. And then they waved us on our way. And then the next night, we we were looking for a campsite. And we got to where the campsite was marked on our map. And we got there, and there was just a beach, you know, campsite. So we were thinking, well, we'll wild camp here. But there was a Japanese lady there. And she also happened to speak English. And we talked to her. And she said, well, you must come back to my house. And she took us back to her house and we spent the night there, you know. And, and we used, um, in the States, we used Warm Showers, which is a group that hosts long-distance touring cyclists. So people provide either a place to camp or a bed or sometimes a meal. And we just met lots of fantastic people through that. And it, it was fantastic. So it really, really 
reaffirms your faith, uh, your faith in human nature, that people are gen- generally kind and considerate and helpful, because that was all we met on the whole of our trip. Yeah. So was it hard deciding to come home, or were you ready to finish your trip? We were ready. I think we, yeah, we were ready. We were due to come back in to our house in April, Um and we came back from the States, cruised back across, having discovered how much nicer it was than flying. And then our tenants refused to get out of the house, which is really upsetting because we were looking forward to being back in our house. We love gardening and growing our own veg and we wanted to do that through the summer, but we couldn't. And then it transpired that they'd been issued with the wrong form or the notice to quit. So it was going that plus getting them out was going to take at least three and a half months before we could get in our house. Um, So we decided that rather than mope around here, we've got our bikes, we've got our camping gear. So we set off inside and flew to the very north of Norway on the Barents Sea in Kirkness and cycled all the way down through Finland to the Baltic and then took a boat over to Germany, which is our favourite place. And we just wanted to be somewhere familiar. And, but by then, I think we'd had enough and we really wanted to get back home, be back in our house, you know, have a settled place to to live for a while. Yeah. No, I get that. I understand that. So you, you said you've got a love of traveling and you've got a bucket list. You know, where are other places that maybe you haven't been to, which are still on your list that you'd like to do? Are there any left or have you ticked them all off? Oh, no way have I ticked them all mm-hmm. off. I'm a, I'm one of these nerdy people. I, I have got a little scratch. If you've seen the scratch maps, of the I world, have. Scra- yeah, well, I've got one of those. I had great fun when I got that scratching off all the countries I've been to. And there's an awful lot we haven't been to. And our... Because we enjoyed Central America so much, we'd now really like to go and do South America. So that sort of shot up the bucket list. Um, I'd like to do some of the islands in the Pacific. Our daughter, who's been in New Zealand, has sort of visited some of those and they look fantastic. And uh, we've only been to Africa twice and I'd like to go and do explore some more of Africa. But, you know, there are adventures you can have at home. Um, have so, you, have you settled back into home life and are you used to not cycling every day? Well, I'm I'm not cycling every day. I try and go for a walk every day, but my husband goes for a cycle most days, so he hasn't given up the cycling yet. But yeah, it's a novelty being back in our house. We're still unpacking at the moment, so and I'm planning future trips. I can't not have anything planned, so. I'm thinking about where should we go next. And we have got a trip planned at the end of the year because our daughter's now moved on to Australia and so we're going to go and visit her in Australia. So that does that makes it easier to come home if we know we've got a, a big trip planned. Fantastic. Now, I believe, now, was it you or your husband who was blogging about it or was it a joint effort? He did all the blogging because I need a lot of sleep. As I said, I'm useless, really. And so I need at least an hour if not two more than him a night so he would write the blog while I was asleep in the tent but I would then read it and comment on it and yeah give him my opinion but he's really I thought it was really good at it I like it and was it okay (laughs) spending all that time with your husband it was great (laughs) (laughs) oh amazing oh Christine thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share your story do you just want to tell everybody the name of your blog and where people can find it Yep, our blog is christineandstephen.co.uk and my I'm on Twitter and the Twitter is CycleGBCoast. And one other thing I'd like to mention is um our daughter. Yes. Yeah. When she when she was in New Zealand, she, after she'd spent her year working there, she decided to walk the length of New Zealand on the Te Aroa Trail, Amazing. the one that goes the whole length of 3,000 kilometres. And I just think that is so amazing that she could do that because, you know, we cycled done all this cycling, cycled 10,000 miles or 16,000 kilometres, but we couldn't do that. Um, hey, you could do that. You could do anything you set your mind to. <laughs> she's obviously, you know, she's got an inspirational mum and dad as a role model, so you're inspiring the adventure in her. Uh, we hope so. Yeah, we 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 would like to think that we've helped that through the years. Absolutely. 
10,000 miles covered, 37 countries visited, two years, four months trip, with a you know, five month recu- recuperation <laughs> in the middle. Um, absolutely inspirational. Any final words of wisdom or advice or anything that you've learned from, from your um, incredible challenge? If you're thinking of do it, just do it because we have absolutely no regrets and we think it was fantastic. And if you do think you're going to do it, then once you tell people, it makes it easier to then go ahead and do it because you've said you're going to do it and you're less likely to back out. And always remember that generally people are really nice and these can, you might be frightened of going to foreign places, but people there generally will help you and be kind and hospitable to you and just go and have a great time. Absolutely. Christine, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Hey Tribe, I hope you are all well and are suitably inspired to take on your own cycling trip. If you are looking for more cycling inspiration, I've actually done so many interviews even this year with women who have gone on and done incredible cycle challenges. So go and take a listen to these episodes. You've got Philippa Cox who cycled from the northernmost northern point of Norway all the way down to southern Spain. You've got Ali Mahoney from I Think Sport who cycled from South Wales Chamonix. You've got Rachma Barkley, who cycled 3,500 kilometers from London to Jerusalem. Ness Knight, who cycled 2,000 miles across the US. And Laura Bingham and her South American cycle adventure. So go and check out Laura Bingham, Ness Knight, Rachma Barkley, Ali Mahoney, and Philippa Cox. These are just some of the women that I've interviewed this year in 2017. And there will be so many other episodes in 2016 and 2015. So please do remember remember to go back and check out the back catalogue of incredible women, women, women cyclists. Now this year, um, not this year, this month, there is an opportunity to win two books by Jennifer Tuff called Keeping the Sea to the Right, One Woman's Journey to Circumnavigate the Entire Baltic Sea by Bicycle. 3,800 kilometers, nine countries, one sea. So we've got two books by Jenny Tuff, which I am going to be giving away to patrons. Now, If you want to win a book, if you are already a patron, your name will be going into the hat at the end of October. If you want to stand a chance of winning, all you need to do is sign up and become a picket become a patron this month. If you go to patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com, you can find out all of the information and what Patreon is. It is basically becoming a supporter of Tough Girl Challenges, of the podcast, of the blog, of me. It's helping to support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. You can donate $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, and it makes a huge, huge difference. This isn't, um, this is about the cumulative effort of every Everybody who listens to the Tough Girl podcast, if you can donate two dollars a month, one pound fifty seven, yeah, one pound fifty seven a month, it makes a phenomenal difference. At the moment, I've got about one hundred and thirty patrons behind the Tough Girl podcast. I'd really love to get that number up to one hundred and fifty. So please do go check out Patreon.com, and all the information, all the show notes are available at ToughGirlChallenges.com. Tons of information for you, but please do become a patron. Please do go check out the website. If you can't afford to do that, I totally understand. That's not a problem. But what I would love you to do is to tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. Tell a work colleague, somebody you run with, somebody you cycle with, somebody who you meet at the school gate, somebody you just chat to on the bus or on the train. Honestly, it just helps to spread the word. Equally, if you're on social media, put a post of you up on Instagram, share who you're listening to, send a tweet to the women that have inspired you, tell the world you're listening to the podcast, um, because that's totally awesome and I would love it. Anyway, have an amazing day, whatever you are doing, make sure you subscribe. New episodes come out every single Tuesday at 7am UK time and we've got so many incredible women who are going to be coming on the Tough Girl podcast in these final few months of 2017. We're still doing a big push to get to 500,000 downloads. We are currently up to 398,000 downloads, which is amazing. So we're so close to hitting 400,000. I can't wait to celebrate that achievement with you all because you are part of this journey. You are what's making it happen. So thank you so much for giving up your time. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it so much. All right, take care. Lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.